Good evening and welcome. Welcome to Social Media and Public Policy. Are we making the connection? This is a Social Media Week event, and it is sponsored by Baruch College's Bachelor of Science in Public Affairs program, also known as the BSPA. My name is Melissa Sultana, and I am the Deputy Director of Academic Partnerships here at Baruch College's School of Public Affairs. Um, a primary responsibility of our office is to focus on the recruitment of students into the Bachelor of Science in Public Affairs program. And many times when we're out in the field, we come across youth who just don't know what public affairs is. They may have heard of some negative stereotypes, like it's cold and bureaucratic and I just don't want to work at the DMV, no thank you, or um, the nonprofit sector, I may be financially in debt for the rest of my life. Um, um, and so we want to change that. We want to change those negative perceptions. Um, and I think at the end of the day, people want to look back on their lives and they want to feel that they made a difference, right? That they've done something meaningful. Oops, sorry. Um, they want to be advocates. They want to be community leaders. They want to have a voice and they want to make a change. I think the issue is often translating those interests and those feelings into a degree, into a career. And that's where the Bachelor of Science in Public Affairs um, program comes in as a perfect opportunity for individuals who want to make a difference. It is the public policy and advocacy degree that teaches you analytical and communication skills and helps you to make that difference. I would like to now introduce our extraordinary guest speaker for tonight, Joyce Sullivan, who's going to touch more on how social media and public affairs can be a very powerful combination. Uh, Joyce Sullivan is a B-SPA professor here at Baruch, um, and she teaches social media communication. She is also CEO and founder of Soch Media Fin, which is a boutique social media consulting firm specializing in social media leadership training for government agencies as well as nonprofit organizations and financial specialty firms. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joyce Sullivan. Thank Melissa, thank you very much for that introduction, and welcome to everybody this evening to Social Media Week. I'm very proud to be here, part of Baruch College. I've been fortunate to be a speaker at Social Media Week the past four years, and being doing it here tonight at Baruch, particularly where I teach, um, some of my students are here, and some of you who've taken my class, this might be the first time you've met me in person since I teach 100% online. Uh, but for this evening, what I'd like next pretty much uh, 45 minutes I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do when I teach social media uh, I have talked this class now I've probably had over a hundred reports of students who've done so I'm going to uh, share some of those reports and more than that what I really want you to come away with is knowing that you can do whatever it is you decide is important and you can make a difference in your world so let me take you through what we've got. And thank you, Melissa, and to the uh, uh, Bachelor of Science um, School of Public Affairs for sponsoring us this evening. Um, wonderful reception, and uh, to all of you who have come this evening to join us. Thank you. Okay, so as you saw from the Social Media Week program, we're going to talk about making the connection, social media's powerful influence on public policy and community. So as I was preparing for this evening, I do a lot of different talks to a lot of different groups, and I thought, what was going to be the key, most important thing to begin with? And I really like to start with the very, very beginning of what's in a word. So with that, I thought, let's take a quick look at the words public and the word policy. So clearly, there's lots of different definitions for the word public. But this particular one, again, coming from uh, the good old dictionary we find somewhere, 
uh, concerning the people as a whole. So there's all the individuals, and then there's the collective. Really, what do all of those people represent as a whole? So speaking as a group. And then certainly policy, as you may think, okay, policy is formed by uh, government agencies or other groups. But in fact, a policy can be adopted or proposed by a government, party, business, or an individual. So I want you to keep that thought, whereas even an individual can be part of making or changing a policy. So moving on from public and policy, then what comes next? Social media, which is why many of us are here this week uh, for the social media program. This is just one of hundreds of events that are going on both on campus where Social Media Week is holding it, as well as independent events like this. So social media, what is all that about? So this particular one I really liked was it's online communication channels uh, dedicated for community-based input, for interaction, content sharing, collaboration. So again, there's that community word, people, how do we come together, share, collaborate, and interact with each other. So clearly we're here in person today, but as you saw from our introductory video, this is one event of many happening around the world this week. You saw the cities that were mentioned, Copenhagen, Lagos, Milan, and more, including New York and right here at Baruch. So everybody is using social to somehow connect, engage, collaborate with causes and individuals that they believe in or that they're passionate about. So taking public policy and social media Here's your famous diagram of how do those three things intersect. So over the next half hour or so, I'm going to show you some examples of how I see that and how some of my students have interpreted that to determine how, in fact, does public and policy uh, come together with social media. So I'd like to start back with a little yesteryear look. Because when people think about social media, they'll think, well, this is the most current thing, or it's been around a couple of years. But in fact, we have been social beings from the beginning of time. And as soon as we could communicate in whatever fashion that was, um, we began to be social and to share our messages. So this is certainly not that, I'm not going to go that far back. We could go much farther back than what I'm going to show you. But this is where I started. So I, I use myself for a lot of examples. So my yesterday was, uh, I grew up where, of course, writing letters was a great way to connect with friends, family, relatives who didn't live nearby. And when I was about ready to enter high school, my grandfather presented me with this typewriter. Now, uh, this is really exactly what it looked like. I still have it. This is a, a picture I got from a, a fellow who really collects typewriters. But I thought this was for me when I felt like I ruled the world, that I was able to begin to talk to people in a way that I never thought I could before. I could write letters. I would write letters to companies or to book authors or I realized that if I had something to say, I could share it. So for me, beginning to share my message through my typewriter was how I began to connect with the world and in many ways uh, began to have my own kind of social media presence. Um, and on the, next to the, my typewriter in going through some of my, uh, my own archives, uh, finding letters through one of my very best friends we used to when she was in college, we would write back and forth. Uh, so those are still forever. Uh, they're the written word. And you think, well, just because something's on a piece of paper somewhere, how would anybody ever find it? Uh, now I'm able to scan it. I can share it. I've shared this across networks with people who may not have ever seen these letters uh, for somebody who uh, is no longer with us, but, but her message lives on. So a part of as we go through this presentation, I want you to think about whatever it is you believe in in your message, there's a way to share that. And, and the written word, again, whether it's spoken and recorded, it's a video, it really is forever universal and infinite. Uh, no matter what we put online or we don't, even if it's offline, eventually does find its way there. So really think about whatever it is you're sharing or saying is so important. Um, and so every word you utter um, has meaning. And think about that uh, before we put you know, finger to keyboard, pen to paper, or uh, recording. OK, so let's move into. Um, from today, let me just see if I can get this to go here. So today, again, this is already 2014, so this is already yesterday. Um, but people will come to me and ask, all right, um, I need a social media program. What should I be on? And they immediately start with the variety of ways you would connect. And certainly, this is just uh, you know, your typical ones, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and so on. Um, 
But in fact, this is what I would call is toward the end of what I'm going to take you through what I call the five questions. The five questions are fairly universal. Uh, people use them in various forms. But I find this is a really important way to begin any conversation about, especially if somebody wants to connect with an audience uh, through social media. So let me take you through the five questions. And uh, many of my students have seen these, uh, people that have worked with me and my company. Um, every conversation I typically start is with these five questions. So uh, by giving them individual names, some of you may have heard like, okay, there's the who are you question, which could be a brand. Again, what do you represent or what is it that you're about? So first of all, it's who are you? My second question is, what is it you have to say? What's your message? Three is, who's your audience? Who are you trying to reach? So that's three. And then number four, it's not until we get to number four, is how do they want to be reached? Uh, and then once you connect, then what? Kind of what's your journey? So in the same way, again, who are you? What do you have to say? Who are you trying to reach? And then number four is how do they want to be reached? That's when you get to, is it Instagram? Is it social media? Is it something else? Um, because until you know really who you are and what your message is, it's not going to really matter what the platform is. So here's a couple of examples, and I know from our audience tonight, uh, high school students, college students, some of you are in the not-for-profit world, some of you work at government agencies. I know uh, some people are interested in the political process, and you may even be running for office or thinking about it. So as each of you are looking at whatever it is you want to be doing, what is the message that you, or questions you want to be asking yourself so that you know where to start? So for instance, who are you? So let's say you're running a not-for-profit agency, or you're a candidate for public office, and I've listed a, a couple of examples on here. So think about where you are in a moment in time, kind of who are you at that second before you get to the next question, which is what do you have to say? Do you want to be sharing your mission? Are you trying to raise funds? Are you trying to get people to join your campaign? Again. What is it you want to say? And then the three is who you're trying to reach. Again, who's that audience? And then it's not until we get to number four, and this is where in days gone by, it used to be how do they want to be reached? It would be you can write a letter, you can make a phone call, you could show up at their door. Um, it was pretty simple. Now, when I typically meet somebody and I'll, you know, we'll have a conversation, I'll say, so how do you prefer I contact you? Never assume, I try not to assume that what I like works for you. And whenever I do meet people, it's a variety of questions. They'll say, well, it depends. If you're a good friend of mine, then I really prefer text. Or if it's work, it's definitely email. If your family lives around the world or you're doing work around the world, I know people that use Skype as a way to communicate and they use the text messaging from that. So again, thinking again who you are, who you're trying to reach, how do those people want to be reached, and then do that. The issue I find is so many individuals will just assume that text works or video works or email works. How many of you have hundreds of emails in your box? People who know me well who want to reach me fast, this is the secret, uh, you have to be on Twitter and you have to send me a direct message. So um, if, I, if somebody really wants to get right through to me, that is even better than text. But that's my personal preference. Uh, and given the world I'm in, that tends to work. Um, one of the areas I do work in is working with regulated industries. Now, there's regulations in every industry, uh, whether it's financial services, government, healthcare, and there's many restrictions on what they can and can't use. And so if some of you are in those fields, or if you're trying to figure out, well, why can't we have a social media account at my healthcare organization, there's a way through that, but it's best to not never mind assume, but to say, well, what's their problem? Why don't they get on social? Because everybody's on social. There really are restrictions and there are rules that people have to abide by. So we're going to cover a little bit of that later in the program of if you are in that space, kind of how would you go about and navigate that? Okay, so let's just say you've met somebody, you find out, gee, the best way to connect is they rather get a text message, you follow up with an email, and then you have an in-person meeting. Social media, like any type of communication, the objective is really to get to that interaction, that one-to-one -one meeting, that personal interaction. Social is a means to an end, just like writing a letter or any other form of communication. So once you connect, then what? This is where, what's your plan? How do you begin to develop really meaningful connections with the people you want to reach? So again, you're running for office, you're trying to raise funds, so you're not for profit, 
or you're working in a healthcare or other regulated industry and you're thinking, how do I really get started? So connect with the people the way they want to be reached. And I'll keep coming back to that five questions. So this is, uh, you don't have an assignment right now, uh, but I really like people to think about, just take a blank piece of paper. And as you're approaching whatever it is you're trying to do, um, ask yourself these five questions so you begin to engage in a meaningful way, whether it's social media or not, it really doesn't matter. Um, but be really clear about who you are and how you want to reach those folks, and then reach them that way. Okay, so yesterday I was, uh, I'm an original New Jersey girl, uh, eldest of six, I grew up in a small dairy farm town. So it's very different now, but um, as I run my class, typically I introduce myself and I, I write something on Blackboard and say what I'm about and where I'm from, and I find it's a great way for everybody to know each other. Uh, many of the students and many of you are from other countries, and it's fascinating to see what uh, you might think is typical here in the United States, what is somebody else's upbringing, regardless of what their age is, depending on the country they're from, they may also have uh, a yesterday story that actually matched mine. One of my yesterday stories was when we were growing up, we had a telephone party line. And what that means is that there weren't enough wires to the town. It was a rural town. And we shared a phone line with one of our neighbors. So we had a very distinctive ring. So you had to listen for the ring and not pick up the phone. And someone said, well, what if somebody else picked up the phone? I said, well, that's the trust factor. So we, trust always came, uh, has followed us through whatever we're doing today. Um, one of my students from one of the former Soviet bloc countries had said, oh, we had a party line. Yes, exactly the same thing, and people would listen in. So uh, depending on where you're from or, or, or what you're upbringing, you may find different ways. So we found this was a great way to connect. So some of my stories weren't all that different, even though we're a number of years apart uh, in age. Uh, so today, I have a number of identities. Tonight, my identity is as Professor Joyce Sullivan, an adjunct lecturer here at Baruch. Uh, my Twitter, and um, as I, I didn't point out on each of the slides, I'm not sure if we have Wi-Fi down, down below ground here, but uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Prof. Joyce Sull. Um, Baruch, the Bachelor of Science um, School of Public Affairs, has their own Twitter account. You can follow them, as well as we have a couple of hashtags for this evening. You know, hashtag would be as a way to follow a conversation. Those hashtags work on Facebook, they work on Twitter, they work on Instagram. And I think now, I think Google Plus is starting, or Google is starting to uh, also um, index some of those hashtags. So it's a great way um, to have a conversation. In fact, after this event is over, I'm going to storify um, any of the conversation we have. And so my next slide, just to illustrate one of the things I do use in sharing stories is storify. And there's just a link to my site if you want to read about what I've been up to for the last couple of years. Um, but it's a great way to collect conversations. So tonight, uh, as well as this week during Social Media Week, I'll take a look at what are the pictures being shared on Instagram with a certain hashtag, what are they talking about on Twitter, and then I'll collect those stories and I'll, I will share it through a link. So that's another great way, as you are connecting with individuals across different organizations, if you are having a social media event similar to this, or you have a way that you want people to share their social messages, there's a great way that you can then collect that and share it and, and archive it. And so I use that quite a bit. Okay, I'd like to go into talking about what some of my students are doing. So the course I teach here at, at Baruch, the School of uh, Public Affairs at the, the Bachelor Program, it's called uh, PAF 3201, Public Affairs, Public Communication and Organization. Um, and depending on who teaches it, they teach it differently, but my class is 100% online. I've taught it for a couple of semesters. My students have joined the program anywhere from, I had a student in Italy who was calling in assignments. Um, we, we get the time zone challenge, but we figured that out. Uh, I had students who were in California. I had one student in, in Nebraska. He worked for uh, United Airlines, and so he was always flying. And really the power of having an internet signal and having a way to communicate I think is extraordinary. And I think certainly the college is doing a lot of that now. And so I'm really honored to be part of that program and running this. So the, the major assignment that I run, and again, for any of you who, are, who have been students of mine or you are students of mine now, uh, please let me know who you are later since we've not met in person, uh, is there's a field report. That's the major assignment for the semester. And what I tell my students is I want you to select an organization that you're passionate about. 
Don't do something you think, I want to hear. That doesn't matter to me. I want to know what you think and what you care about. Because now with the power of connecting online, you can do anything, you can reach anybody, and you can share your message with the world. So you give me an organization you care about with a URL, I check it out, I make sure you know, it meets the criteria. And then what uh, you then need to do is you then connect with that organization. So this is the next challenge. My class is not just going online and connecting, that's the first part. But once you do connect, you go to their website, do they have a LinkedIn, do they have a Twitter, do they have an Instagram, do they have a YouTube site? Start talking to them through those channels. And my students have found out either people don't answer, okay, so they say they have a Twitter account, but they're really not using it, or they have a YouTube channel, but the last thing they put up was two years ago. So it gives you an indication of, is this the way to really reach an organization or not? So um, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of, of what they've gone through. But before that, once I connect on the social channels and they actually speak to a real person, so to speak, through whether it's Twitter, Instagram, not so much Instagram, but uh, Twitter has been the most effective, Instagram a little bit, then they have to go to an event. This would be an event. Or, or in addition to an event, they need to interview somebody who works at an organization. So all of a sudden, they ha you have to get out from behind your laptop and your Wi-Fi and show up in person. So we take online, to offline and build those relationships. And then after that, there's a field report. It's a very defined template that they fill out. And so um, uh, I'm going to share with you kind of my philosophy of how this works and some of the events and some of the organizations that they connected with and what came about. So this is what I tell my students when they're doing the reports. They'll say, well, what should I write about? I say, I want to smell the popcorn. I want to feel like I am in the room with you. I want to know, is it too hot? Is it too cold? Uh, were there crying babies in the community uh, meeting that you went to? Uh, was it a political rally? Um, I want to feel like I was there. So I want you to tell me about everything you see, the color of the walls, just make it as represent as you can possibly be of somebody who's not there. So I always use this expression, I want to smell the popcorn, that, um, it's that level of sensory experience because it's through your eyes that you're getting to explain this. Now, if somebody else could go to the same event and have an entirely different uh, interpretation of what happened, this is your interpretation, it's your chance to tell the world how you experienced it and what you thought. Okay, so let's talk about some examples. So one of my students uh, who's from the Ukraine, she said, I'm really passionate about um, children's orphanages in in my country at a certain age, uh, I think at 16, they have to leave and they're really sent out without any protection or help. So she was very passionate about wanting to open uh, one of these support kind of transition for uh, children who've been in orphanages. Uh, there's a group called Maya's Hope she found online. She started to, um, I told all my students, you must have a Twitter account and so being having a social presence is a requirement for the class. And so she connected with Maya's Hope, started to tweet, they answered her right back. There's nothing more exciting when you send some message off into the ether and, and somebody responds. So not only did she connect with them, they had a big fundraising gala event. She and her husband went. She got very involved with the organization. In fact, on her way to the event, um, in fact, she, she shared some photos in her report. There's a picture of her with this really sweet little lady on her arm uh, nun from the Philippines, I think, probably about four foot ten. And as um, a student was coming out of the subway, she sees this little nun. Oh, can I help you? Oh, yes, yes, I'm going to this event. Where are you going? And she realized this was the founder of Maya's Hope. There she was on the subway. And she got to um, escort her to the, to the gala. So, so this was something she felt strongly about. She found an organization that was helping to opening these transitions in different countries and in the Ukraine was one of them. So again, that was not my idea, that was her idea. Um, another student was very interested in domestic violence and in what are different organizations doing for women. She found her justice. She attended an event which was climbing, I think, I don't think it was up all the stairs of the Empire State Building, but they had an in-person event and they made it fun with music and she wound up connecting with that organization and got involved in his, um, and doing some other things. Um, so those are two examples that um, they went through. 
for many of you that are working in city government or you're interested in internships. I know certainly here in the School of Public Affairs in the undergraduate program, there are city internships. Some of my students who were working for some of the city council members, um, they went to an event as part of the council member that they were supporting. They were able to do their report on that and really integrated to that. Um, for some of the students when they were getting the reports ready, I would tell them, you should think about, share. you don't have to share this publicly, but if this is some, an area where you really want to have your career or you're looking to grow your own professional network, you might think about sharing your report with um, whoever it is you're working for. So some of the students have done that and they have uh, done the report as their way to reflect the communication of whatever the organization is. And it's always positive, but you know, it's an objective view of here's a, an event that was run, how effective was the event, did it really connect with the people they wanted to connect with or not, and so many of them have shared it. So I know we've had a number of students who have taken their internships and turned their field reports um, as part of the class and then shared it back with the organization. Uh, the Y or some of the other organizations, we had another great report that one of our students did. This was kind of fun. I had a student who said, you know, I'm really passionate about music education. And there is, uh, VH1 has a, a foundation called Save the Music. So if many of you uh, have come through, certainly I know stateside, the, uh, the public school program, sometimes the first things to go are the arts. Music and the arts might be the first things that comes out of the budget. Uh, so there's different groups that are saying your music's important. So my first thought was, gee, I don't know if you're gonna be able to get into VH1, uh, but she was so passionate about this topic uh, she wrote a letter, she went to the website, um, and this is the other thing besides social media. If somebody lists their name and their email, send them an email. Say, hi, I'm a student at Baruch College. I'm very passionate about music education. I would very much like to uh, speak to somebody. So not only did she get an answer back, she got an in-person interview with the executive director of the uh, Save the Music program. They had a gala event at VH1 that she was invited to, uh, and again, she, uh, this would have never happened if she had not said this is what I believe in and I'm passionate about. Um, so all of these examples are different ways for you to think about what you're passionate about, what you want to do. Uh, another one of my students, uh, very much interested in the healthcare system, especially hospitals. Um, New York Presbyterian, he had mentioned as an area he really wanted to look at. And I thought, well, it's a pretty big place. I don't know how you're going to get in. Went to their website. He said, oh, they, they have these walks every um, how to be healthy. And he saw they had a sponsored walk. So he uh, signed up, he went, and somebody from the hospital walked along. He was able to interview this person while they're walking. Um, so he not only then completed his report, but wound up uh, getting invited to uh, speak to some of the other hospital directors. So there's many more examples. These are just some of them, but I just like to use this to show you that when people say to me, oh, I could never talk to so-and-so, or uh, some organization's too big. So again, this is about public policy. Um, think about what you believe in what's important, and then just go and find somebody to um, ask that question to. So all of these students came in and said, I don't think I'll ever be able to get in and speak to anybody, and they all did. And my last one, uh, which was kind of fun, uh, one of my students, uh, and he's a vet of the, um, uh, Afghanistan war and uh, he's in the veterans program here he signed up for the class and very passionate about transportation alternatives um, he kept emailing them he connected on their social media no answer no answer no answer and he said I really want to do this program but nobody is answering me so we said okay let's take a look at their website we found out where their address is they said hey they're about two blocks from the college you know when are you free because well, I'm free about you know 4.30 on next Tuesday, I said, okay, your assignment is to go in person and knock on the door. So if all else fails, there's always in person. So uh, here's somebody who's been um, you know, in combat. And when it came right down to, you know, I gotta show up in person. So we kind of scripted it out since he wasn't able to connect virtually. He showed up, he wrote his report and said, I went up these rickety stairs and the paint was peeling and it was a small building. He got up there and introduced himself and they said, oh my God, we need your help. We're so busy, we can't even check our email. So um, many times showing up in person is the way to go. 
Um, but there's a variety of different ways that you can reach your audience. So that one's always fun, and I think he's still involved with that organization today. Uh, one of my students is, an is very interested in architecture and urban land. Um, he went to an event on how do you decide when you're building a religious structure in, on city property. So there's a whole community of architects, real estate, people interested in land development as well as zoning. You know, there's a number of different things, and so this is an area that he really felt passionate about. He's originally from Czechoslovakia. He thought eventually he might want to go back and, and help do some land and urban development uh, when he goes back there. But for now, he's, uh, last I checked, he's still here in New York uh, working with an organization uh, that's closely affiliated. Sustainability and certainly um, eating well, health food, um, solar, I mean, there's a lot of different things to do. So um, I'll kind of stop there. And my last one is um, certainly I've had a number of animal rescue uh, reports. I love, I love, I have three cats. So one of my cats has a Twitter account, which I'm not sharing tonight, but uh, there's lots of ways to talk to people online, even through their, their, their cat accounts. Uh, but yeah, we've done a lot of inter interesting things working with organizations for uh, animal rescue um, and health. Okay, so now I'd like to get into the steam engine part of the presentation. I think, what does the steam engine have to do with this? Um, a gentleman I used to work with when I was in one of my former uh, corporate jobs, an engineer, and now in compliance, and he was telling a story about steam engines. And he said, you know, the thing with steam engines were they were able to go faster once the brakes got better. And I was thinking about that in any program I've worked on for social media, you think, well, a lot of individuals or organizations will think, I can't have a social media program because you just never know what people are going to do, so the policy is no. Um, but however, you know, many of us have uh, the power of a smartphone in our hand and an internet connection, so um, it's pretty hard to stop those people from talking about whatever. So um, I'd like to start the next section with talking about if you are going to have a social media program, how do you really have some kind of, never mind controls, but policies around that? And so when we get into whether it's talking about public policy or organizational policy, knowing how you want to organize that program and then who can connect and use it is really important. So um, as the breaks get better, you can go that much faster. So the social media process and communication for me, and this applies for any organization. Um, when I was in banking a, couple, a number of years ago, I had started to do social media programs for a not-for-profit on my own time. And I had offered to give a talk to the individuals at the bank who were interested in social media. But they were telling me, well, kind of nobody's in charge and everybody's in charge. So I put this little chart together to say, this is what happens initially in organizations with social. People will think, well, you know, nobody owns it and everybody owns it. So I really think of a social media team, and each of your orgs could be a little different, would be, okay, legal doesn't own it, but they're going to have a part. I work very closely with legal and compliance teams when we're developing a social program, if I'm working with an outside organization or even a for-profit. Um, certainly the people in sales are in the field. Communicators need to know. So having either a core team that touches each of these individual groups, human resources is essential, certainly IT, research and development, depending on which area you're in, uh, marketing and so on. So social really touches everyone, so they have a part of it as well as they uh, contribute to it. So I'll leave you with seven points. I know there's a lot on these slides, but I thought it was important to share as you are looking at programs for your own organizations or ones you're working for, or if you're working somewhere and they don't quite have this. Nobody grew up or were born with social and understanding it. People I work with at FINRA, which is the regulatory body for financial services, or the SEC, which will also get involved in some of the regulatory. Nobody grew up knowing this. It's individuals like yourselves who either get involved or volunteer or you get a job or you have an idea to start a program. It's, that's how these policies change and incorporate this so that you can really use it effectively. So any governance structure, certainly if at the head of the top of the house, if the people who are running, say you're running a political campaign, you would think somebody needs to really be setting the policy. So having a governance structure is essential. 
uh, policies and procedures, again, how do you incorporate social media into existing policies and procedures you have? I come across this all the time where any organization will say, well, yeah, we, we have policies on how our employees behave or what they do, or when they can come and go, as well as how we operate. Uh, so I really typically recommend you find a way to incorporate any kind of social program into that because it really touches everything. Some groups start separately and then they move and, and incorporate it. Um, having a due diligence process, I mean, that can go across many, many things. Given social is Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it, um, who are you working with? Most folks are going to hire an outside provider or a third party to do that. So you want to have a due, good due diligence process. Training, can't emphasize that enough. If you are going to run a social program in your agency, in your, uh, the political campaign you're running, um, make sure you have the proper training of who runs that administrative account. I mean, I have five or six different Twitter accounts, and I certainly want to make sure I'm not tweeting from the wrong account. Uh, we've all read those kind of horror stories of brands that uh, somebody mistakenly sent a tweet out from uh, they thought was their personal account and was the corporate brand account. So you really want to have proper training for uh, your guidelines. Oversight of content, again, you think if it's social, why can't you just tweet away? Um, but having that overall governance policy and training, then you really still continue to have ongoing oversight from time to time of how are we doing, are people sharing our messages. In the end, you do want to reach the people you want to reach most effectively. Um, but you want to make sure the content you're sharing, there is some periodic oversight of that. And in some organizations, and maybe right here at the college too, uh, you know, if you share something in writing, it has to be archived. And archiving it requires, uh, whether it's software or some other procedure. So audit and compliance, from time to time, somebody's going to want to come and see that. Uh, and then certainly success measurements. Um, how do you know your campaign was effective? Uh, certainly political campaigns now, I think now you'll see social is standard. How do you know that message you sent out really works? Or if you are trying to reach a different an audience to learn about your not-for-profit, how do you know you were effective? So you want to have some good success measurements. So uh, I wanted to leave that with, for some of you that are really trying to put together your own program and how would you go about doing it. These are some of the seven steps I typically recommend. Okay, so. Uh, I just want to touch a little bit on my own. Uh, these are my various social media sites. Uh, when I'm not Professor Joyce, I'm Joyce M. Sullivan. That's most of my identity uh, when I'm not here at the college. Um, and what I've done is just circle. You'll see um, where, the, where the arrows and the circles are. Every time you hit a keyboard or you type anything, that's a message. And if you're in an organization that has to save or archive, so a tweet, a like, Anything, again, if you hit a keyboard to do a thumbs up, um, that's a message that needs to be recorded potentially, depending on where you, you live or work. Um, and I've just circled some of the areas across YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, not Instagram, but Twitter uh, to do that. Okay, social media tools. Again, many of you may be very, very familiar at this point. You know, LinkedIn is, can you believe it, it's over 10 years old. Uh, is now is the standard way for professionals to connect across industries. Uh, Facebook was, has been around longer, certainly has only been open for a while. So the top one, you know, maybe not Google Plus anymore, but uh, almost the top ones are starting to be a little bit on the more traditional side. And the bottom social media programs, you know, they're just exploding. I wouldn't recommend Snapchat for, uh, for putting out your social program because even though they say it disappears, you know, anything that goes into the internet probably is forever. But there's many different ways to connect with an audience, and, and these are just a variety of them. OK, so let me just wrap up with, uh, again, the five questions. Um, I just want to take you back to that. If you go, there's so much information to, to read and find. Uh, just keep coming back to these five questions to identify, again, who you are, what you have to say, who, uh, who you're trying to reach, and then how do they want to be reached, and go where they are. One example I'd like to share is I was at an event, somebody from the Wall Street Journal, uh, they have a very strong digital media, digital presence, and they were talking about they really wanted to grow their readership in more uh, demographic in you know Midwest, maybe more with kind of soccer moms, and they thought, well, a lot of them are on Pinterest. So the Wall Street Journal opened a Pinterest site, and what they found was their readership went up 40%. Why? Because they went where the readers they wanted to reach are. 
So you would think, why would I want a Pinterest site? Well, if that's your audience, that's where you want to go. So that's why, after hearing that, I thought, you want to make sure, don't go open a site, find your audience first and go there. So this last thing I really want to share with you, this is a picture of a woman. Her name is um, Annie Kenny, and um, Annie died about 70 years ago. She was a mill worker in England and a member of the downtrodden working class and an early suffragette. She was at a town hall meeting, and she asked a member of parliament for his position on the right to vote. When he refused to answer, she pushed back, and she made such a ruckus that she went to jail for three days. By her courage, that particular moment in time, she amplified a movement that ended up changing the world. Millions of women could have taken their turn in that moment, but it took Annie to step up and do it. This picture of Annie is on the front cover of Seth Godin's new book, which is called What to Do When It's Your Turn. I just happen to have a copy here because this is kind of what I'm doing these days, among other things. But, um, and I like to share that because, again, there was no social media. You know, Annie went to jail for three days. But I want you all to think about wherever you are in your life today, whatever is meaningful and important to you, I want you to think about, is today or this moment your turn to stand up and say what it is you want to do or to start what you believe in? Because nobody else might do it. So it took Annie, it, took, it was her turn. She stood up and said something, went to jail and started a movement and changed the lives for many women who got the vote. So whatever it is that you care about matters to you. I want you to think about that today and to do that. So I'll leave you with this quote, which of course is attributed to many people. I think Hillel the Elder is, is really the originator of it. If not me, who? If not now, when? So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and um, go forth. Thank you very much. Um, and this is more information about the Brook program here. So uh, certainly uh, this is being recorded. We'll have this online. You can check it out. And, and certainly I'll be taking some questions if anybody would like to. Um, I think we have a microphone. Um, and if not, I'll be around for a little few minutes after that to uh, answer your questions. So again, thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of Social Media Week. There's a lot of events going on. And uh, hopefully I'll see you there. And if not, I would love to see you online. Please say hello to me on my Twitter. And I'll, I might answer back. Thanks again. Thank you.